Hello, in this video I will provide a short introduction to response surface methodology or RSM. Uh, I will um, focus on explaining the basic principles of RSM, the approach in general. Uh, we will talk a little bit about the second order model and the response surface we can generate from this model. Uh, we will also talk uh, a little bit about the method of steepest ascent or descent which is a very important part of the RSM approach. Um, first of all, uh, the definition of RSM uh, can be the following one, provided by Doug Montgomery. So response surface methodo methodology is a collection of mathematical and statistical techniques useful for the modeling and analysis of problems in which a response of interest is influenced by several variables and the objective is to optimize this response. So that's the generic or general definition of RSM. The optimization can be for example a maximization or minimization uh, in our RSM. So RSM can be viewed as the procedure for performing a sequential search or finding the path towards the optimum uh, like a maximization, for example, through experimentation. Uh, in this illustration, the yellow area is the region of operability where we are allowed to run our process, let's say. The contour lines illustrate how the response changes over this region. So here you have the, the contour lines, like 65 response values, 70 and so on. Of course, these response values and, and contour lines are not known beforehand because otherwise we will not be able be in need of, of, of running experiments. But anyway, this is for illustration purposes. Um, assume that in our first experiments uh, here, a factorial design in, in three factors with center points. We start in this area, which is between 65 and 70 in response values, let's say. Now, the model we can fit uh, from this first experiment will provide us with, with knowledge of, of course, which factors are active, but also uh, a path in which uh, we can assume that the response will increase if we follow that path. And this uh, path is called the, the path of steepest ascent in this case, because we are trying to maximize the response here. Now in um, RSM we will follow this path, this path by making single uh, experiments to like this for example to discover um, or, or explore how the response behaves uh, when we follow this path. And once we see that the response stops to increase and starts to decrease, we will move our experimental area or region to this new region, closer to what we believe to be the optimum. So this is the, the path uh, with fastest improvement in the response. We call it the, pa the, the path of steepest ascent. And once we, we feel like we, we have located an interesting area, which might may be the local or global optimum, we will move uh, the experimental region uh, to this new area or new region. Uh, this may require several, atten several attempts, of course, and we may not be able to do this in one shot, like in this case by one application of, of the method of steepest ascent. Uh, this is for illustration purposes, of course, but in this, um, in this new experimental region, closer to the optimum, local or global optimum, a more complex design is often needed to be able to fit a second order model. And one example of this a more complex design is the central composite design, which is illustrated here. And we'll come back to that, that also in later videos. Okay, so the underlying logic of this illustration is that far away from the optimum or in a larger area, the response surface is often fairly well described uh, with a simple model, such as the first order model, with, where we only have the main effects part of the model. 
Uh, when, however, when we approach the optimum or when in a smaller area, it's usually the case that a more complex model is, is um, necessary to provide a good appro approximation of the underlying surface or true surface. <clears throat> a second order model uh, often provides a good approximation to this underlying true surface. And here you see uh, the model assumption for the second order, order model. Uh, part of this uh, is also that we, we have to know when a, a more complex model is necessary. And the typical way to, to acquire this knowledge, if we, if we need a more complex model than, for example, a first order model or a, a first order model with interactions, is to use center points. Now, in this um, simple example, uh, we have one response and one factor with low level and high level. And we have, let's say we have run experiments in, at the low and high levels, and these are the, the response values, 10 and 20. Now, given the factorial points and the response values we have already, if we were to make a prediction of the response in the center point between the low and high level, uh, it would the best prediction we can make with the knowledge we have is the average of the response at the low and high level. And we are uh, there, there by assuming a linear relationship. And if we make this assumption and this prediction, it will be the average of 10 and 20 is 15. So that would be the average um, or predicted response value in the center point. Now, if we add center points to the design, uh, like this, where we make actual experiments and we record the response values, um, we can calculate the average of these uh, response values in the center points. Uh, and let's assume that these are, the average is 19.5. And we can compare the, the uh, average value of the actual center points with the average value of the predicted uh, center points from the factorial portion of the of the design. And if this difference is big enough uh, between these two averages, then we have a significant curvature. And the response, the true response may, for example, look something like this green line uh, here. So we have this, this behavior of the response, for example. So, in the ANOVA, uh, you also get a curvature test so that you can compare, for example, the p-value of this curvature test. And if the p-value is very low then, uh, or lower than the significance level, for example, then it's an indication of, of significant curvature and that you may need a more complex model uh, to, pro to describe the, the underlying true response surface. Uh, and, and this uh, test, you have NF, which is the number of runs in the factorial points or in the factorial portion of the design. NC is the number of runs in the center point. Y bar F is the average of the runs in the factorial points and Y bar C is the average of the runs in the center point. And then you calculate this um, ratio, which is the sum of squares of pure quadratic, which is um, provided also in the software. Okay, let's move on to the method of steepest ascent, uh, which is a sequential procedure to take steps in the path of fastest increase or decrease in the response. And in this case, we usually make a, a simplification so that we say that the direction is proportional to the estimated main effects in the first order model. Uh, the method has more or less four steps. Um, and in this table, you get the steps and also some notation. Uh, you can also read more about this in the course book. But in the first step, you will choose a step size in one of the variables, xj in this case. So delta xj is the step size in, in one of the variables. We're working here in coded variables, uh, first of all. And then uh, a suggestion uh, to pick which variable to pick is, for example, to pick the variable with the largest, largest absolute regression coefficient. And then in step two, uh, 
we need to calculate the step size in all the other variables encoded values. And this is given by this um, equation here. So we have delta xi, which is the uh, step size in variable i, is proportional to the step size in um, uh, xj, of course. And this proportion is um, given by the ratio between uh, beta i and beta j. Beta i is the regression coefficient for variable i, and beta j is the regression coefficient for xj. Now, when all these um, uh, step sizes are calculated for all the variables that are significant in the, in the model, we convert the step sizes into actual factor values. And then we conduct experiments with the variable settings in the different steps. Now, we should also, I should also mention there that, that the step size uh, in the first variable here will determine all the other step sizes. So we also have to be a little bit careful when we pick the step size. So how many steps do we want to uh, conduct, for example? How, how um, broad step sizes should we take, for example, and so on. Um, but more on that later. Okay, here is an example. Uh, assume that these are the contour lines for how the response behaves in the plane of xi, x1 and x2. And now the, the, the path of steepest ascent in this case is uh, perpendic perpendicular or orthogonal to the contour lines uh, according to this dashed line here. So this is the path of steepest ascent. If we want to follow that, we see that the, the contour lines, which are unknown, but here it's given. Uh, the response values is 40, 50, 60, 70. So somewhere around here is, we assume some sort of um, global or, or local optimum or maximum. So in the path of steepest ascent, we make single experimental runs along this path uh, and we record the response values. So in this case, we make experiments in these points. How many we fit is, is subject to change and, and we can choose, of course, how big the step sizes are, but, but uh, these are the experiments we make. So we will probably find that somewhere around here uh, we have a uh, maximum value and then the, the response will stop start to decrease. So probably this, this is an interesting new area to move uh, in, toward in the experimental region. So we can also illustrate this in a graph like this. So we have the response and we have the steps, step one, two and so on. And we can <clears throat> illustrate how the response behaves uh, in the different steps. And uh, hopefully in this sort of procedure, you find sort of a cut cutoff uh, when the response starts to decrease again. And somewhere around here and uh, around in the vicinity of the experimental settings for um, steps 10 and 11 around this area is a new interesting experimental region. So that is more that was more on the uh, st the path of steepest ascent or descent. Uh, to sum things up in this introduction, I will end with with this mountain climbing analogy. And uh, we can compare the sequential experimental journey uh, to that of climbing a mountain, for example. At first, we are in this area. We're at the foot of the mountain and we assume that also that it's foggy, so we cannot really see exactly uh, where the top is. Uh, but we want to climb the mountain. Uh, so what can we do? Well, we can start by making a small experiment where we explore our near vicinity. So in this area, we're exploring it to find out in, in uh, what direction the inclination is highest. Now in design of experiments, we typically explore the experimental region with a fractional or a full, full fact, uh, to a level factorial design. Uh, so we get to know in which direction uh, the inclination is highest. So in this area, uh, we may be interested in, in, in uh, a fractional or, or a regular to level factorial design. After this exploration, we know the path of steepest ascent. 
And from this first design, we can also fit a response surface. Uh, let's say it, it is a first order uh, model. For example, we will have a plane like this. And this plane will point us in a direction of steepest ascent, like this. Of course, this does not guarantee us that we have the correct direction toward the highest peak of the mountain. No method that I know of will, will guarantee that, but it will guarantee us to at least move in the direction that takes us higher up um, if we move along this path, but this path of steepest ascent. Now assume that we walk along this path uh, of steepest ascent and we in DOE we would make experiments along this path. We, we can say that we make experiments in these areas. <clears throat> We're walking uh, uh, up the hill until we are walking down the hill again. We feel that we are going down. Now then we can back up a bit and um, and explore uh, the new experimental region or area. So we moved. We have moved here through the method of steepest ascent. Now in design of experiments, when we are closer to the local or global maximum or minimum, we usually need a second order model to describe the response surface well. In the new experimental region, it, it is. Um, it usually makes sense to start with a factorial design with center points so that we can test for curvature. So let's assume we're starting with a design like this. We can ask ourselves if we have significant curvature. Um, if it is significant, if, if yes, uh, then um, a second order design is needed to, in order for us to describe the underlying response surface in a good way. For example, a, a second order design such as the central composite design can be built sequentially from this first design. So by adding these stars or axial points and more on that later. <clears throat> and through this second order design and the model we can build from that, we can try to explore uh, and fit a second order response surface to, to better describe the hill of this mountain in this area. So with that um, uh, mountain climbing analogy, uh, I wanted to sum things up and, and say that this is basically what we're doing in, in RSM. We're finding uh, a way, a sequential procedure to, to climb the mountain, to minimize or maximize a response, optimize a response of interest. Okay. Thank you for listening and uh, see you next time. Bye-bye.